So All or Nothing was such a ridiculously profound and interesting release for the story that I've been inundated with thousands of comments from you guys, discussion about what you saw and what you think might be happening. There's also a lot of other little topics and things that even in a well over hour long video I did earlier in the week discussing the patch, I still haven't managed to get round to. So today, I want to do more talk about the lore and story of this most recent episode in kind of a Q&A style format where I pick out the best, most most profound interesting comments you guys sent and we spiral off of those in addition I want to remind us of two particular cutscenes that we saw before going into this release that I wanted to squeeze in that original video but kind of didn't have time for and have some really fun things to talk about so yeah uh, this is gonna feel a bit like a Q&A which was a series went away a bit in 2018 but now by the way that I've stopped regularly twitch streaming which kind of replaced the q and I'm looking to bring that series back so bear that in mind as you watch this video if you have any questions for me a proper Q&A series should be returning very soon, and I am fielding questions for it. But okay, so let's jump in and see what we got. First is this cutscene from the finale of last Living World season, One Path Ends, in which the Eye of Janthir gives us a possible premonition and depiction of the future as Balthazar rampages through the Crystal Deserts. Nothing. Oh. So that's the cutscene in its full, hopefully you remember it. Uh, rewinding here to the start, let's play it back through and pick a couple of details. Obviously we've now been to the Crystal Desert and we can wonder, a year down the line, how much of this actually came to pass? Or, well, you know, over a year down the line now, actually, even interior time, right? Because it's synced to real time. So what do we actually see? And immediately, the first thing the eye shows us was this dragon head, right? Uh, and within the context of the end of One Path End, seeing a dragon head straight away might be kind of a curious thing. If you recall, when this first came out, we were wondering what the dragon even was and what was going on. Well, at the end of this patch, could it be that the Eye of Janthir was showing us Kraukka Toric post this encounter. I know we're not really in the Crystal Desert anymore, but the Eye of Janthir wasn't necessarily preoccupied with just that region of space. It's just we, the community, were because that was the location of the next expansion, and there was kind of a suggestion that all important upcoming story would be there. But it'd be kind of amazing for the devs to have thought of this idea of the next Elder Dragon fight it was going to lose its eye uh, in the, at some point during the next expansion and its adjoining Living World season. And so right as they segue into all of it, right at the end of Season 3, they give us a hint. What if this is supposed to be a representation of Krauk? Now, I know what you're thinking. It doesn't look like Krauk. Krauk's got a bit of a turtle head and a weird different shaped mouth, right? It doesn't look particularly crystalline. Maybe this is just supposed to be some particularly abstract thing. But the single glowing eye with another dead one... Really? And then in this uh, Elder Dragon fight we just had, we see Aureen as messed up si the side of uh, Kraukadork's face and particularly blow one of his eyes out. I don't know. It seems like something pretty cool to look back at. There is another depiction of a dragon here, and it's with a spear going through its throat. Uh, also, we pan out here and we see a crowd of cheering people. As this dragon actually looks like it's more on fire than anything else, you might think that it's something to do with Primordus. I tend to think that the fire theme probably is artistic creative license, maybe mostly in the cutscene because we were going to the Path of Fire expansion, maybe? I'm not too sure with all of that. Maybe burning and fire will factor in massively when we kill a dragon. But the, to go back to basics, what are we looking at here? What is this depicting? Well, the eventual defeat of the next dragon, hopefully, or a dragon in the future. Um, but when? Clearly, this didn't happen a second ago. The direct linking of a dragon missing its eye into this here does seem to suggest that the two things we saw were the same. But when will this happen? Next episode, maybe? The spear is probably the greatest, most interesting thing to look at. As of this release, we now have loads of these spears, right? 
obviously, when uh, this cutscene was created, uh, the writers already knew about the spear in the Crystal Desert Balthazar would have been looking for from the novel. So maybe they were still thinking at that point that we would recreate the proper spear one for one. But by the time this most recent release came out, they'd instead gone to a different idea where we'd create lots of mini spears that were a bit weaker. And now this part of the cutscene doesn't sort of telegraph what will happen eventually properly, if that all makes sense. Um, but yeah, a spear going through him and obviously spear manufacturing was a big part of the most recent release. This hasn't come to pass, but will it since a second ago we saw the eye missing? The rest of the cutscene, uh, we can kind of see similar moments of. If this is supposed to be Am Noon, you could suggest that this is showing the start of Living World Season 4 when Am Noon was attacked. Uh, I, I think as we were going into this, it was more just sort of suggestive that Balthazar threatened the place, you know, because again, it's the fire theme, not necessarily branding. Here we have Balthazar looking out across a plateau of doom and devastation. This certainly never came to pass, but destroyed, lifted out pyramids around. Well, we we saw some of these uh, in the brand. Um, so some of it seems to have happened. Some of it seems not to have. There's been so many premonitions and future predictions and prophesizers and seers and stuff throughout this franchise. Not all of them get it completely right. But that's what uh, the Eye of Janthea was showing us. And particularly those early dragon shots are really cool. And I definitely wanted to show off. The other cutscene I want to see was actually very recent. It wasn't this episode. It was the one just before. Let's remind ourselves of what Aureen saw in her many visions. So in this depiction of her death, we actually get to hear her death wail and stuff, which, um, you know, you kind of miss out on in the actual event of it. Uh, so yeah, some people have been pointing out that in all of these visions of her death, it seems like everyone kind of dies with her. So here in this frame, for example, we see time is there and then afterwards, presumably she's dead. So maybe the, the timeline we're in is slightly different to many of the ones that Aureen saw because many of the other people survived here. You can see Zephyr is dead and yet in our time timelines if he is alive we explicitly saw that by the way on one of the live streams the developers suggested that when asked who else died they wouldn't actually answer the question which suggests maybe someone else did die uh but uh, aside from that it's pretty consistent right the music is so powerful to listen to after we know what actually happened here and you get this incredible pose just as a reminder for you guys this is exactly how she looked after she'd been impaled before and amazingly if you look in this shot here that depiction of like a spear going through her throat and out of her mouth seems to line up with the Eye of Janthea's vision more than anything else. I don't know really if that's what the Eye of Janthea was showing us. Is it Aureen that we're supposed to see in this moment? But it's so visually similar, maybe it's not a coincidence. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about in a second in this video, as prompted by one of you guys in the community, is the idea of a, an explosion of magic in her death. And you'll notice that in Aureen's visions of her own death, that kind of doesn't happen. And you'd expect it to. There was an explosion of magic with the Bloodstone. There was an explosion of magic with Balthazar going down. A lot of that's still swirling around within Aureen. I mean, otherwise, Kraukatorik wouldn't have been as interested in her in the first place. And yet, when she dies, did that really happen? It might have, it, because there was a lot of crazy chaos going on, branding happening everywhere. But it was all kind of Kraukatorik branding, and it was just the mountain falling around. There wasn't a Bloodstone Fen style explosion, right? Uh, and we might say that that has some, lends some plausibility to the idea of Aureen coming back to life uh, in that, you know, her physical form has left, but all the magic contained within her spirit has ascended, right? Uh, and it could be very deliberate that even in this vision, we don't see 
uh, these kinds of magical explosions. It is just kind of her corpse there, right? Branded as, as we can clearly see it is here. There's one final thing to talk about with this cutscene. As I just play it through on mute for you guys here. And that's the Aureen has this whatsoever. There could be some weird lore inconsistencies that I hope the devs work on. Uh, but it's to do with Glint. And the fact that in Edge of Destiny, Glint actually says to the, the band. And this is clearly written just to up the stakes for the novel. So that the readers of the novel wouldn't know what's going to happen. But Glint says to her allies in the with the big battle about to happen, she says, I can't see much further forward into the future. It's cloudy to me. I don't know what's going to happen. And so then when you read the novel, you realize Glint dies and you realize she couldn't see the future because Glint was dead and she can't see a future in which she's dead. Like that was a limitation of Glint's power. And again, that's clearly just a construct in the novel so that... Glint doesn't have to reveal she dies to Destiny's Edge and then it all feels really weird. It takes a very different turn. That way we can have this adrenaline-filled battle within the novel and think that we might actually beat Kralkatorik. Um, but now it looks kind of weird because Glint couldn't see past her own death. As according to the novel, unless we're suggesting she lied, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. She couldn't, but Aureen does see her own death, and even if we take Kralkatorik at face value, Kralkatorik sees his own death, right? He, he, he prophesizes a world without him. So, you know, there's a lot going on there as to why these two can see, but Glint can't. And you might say, oh, Aureen can see because she's going to ascend, which maybe it would be the way that we're going here, but why can Kralkatorik see past his own death if he's not going to ascend? I mean, we're presuming this isn't an ascended being, is it? Though, people have always liked to compare gods and dragons, and maybe they're all on par as ascended creatures. So, um, yeah, that, that's going to be a thing that hopefully isn't too clunky and weird. And if you really look into a lot of minutia of Glint uh, over this time, because her story's become so stacked, her post-humorous story sp specifically... Uh, there are some weird oddities. But yeah, two cool cutscenes. Definitely wanted to talk about. Let's get into some of your comments now, though. In no particular order whatsoever. Uh, I just think that there's a lot of really great stuff that we can get out. And we'll start off with some of the earlier comments and moving up. So first, we actually have three in a row. One commenter who's responding to themselves instead of editing. Uh, Dargosian here, who's actually responsible for the super edit you saw on the channel uh, a while back with the Aspect Arena and another one coming up very soon. Uh, actually had three really cool insights. I want to talk about each of them. First of all, I'm hyped for death-branded Aureen in episode six, whom we cleanse at the Altar of Glore. So this first comment, there are two packets to, to deal with, and it's a fun idea. So... Aureen coming back via Ascension is an idea. Aureen coming back via Joko magic and becoming an Awakened Dragon is an idea. You could even combine the two potentially. Aureen coming back because she's been resurrected by the thing that just killed her, right? Is another idea. And that I didn't discuss on the video whatsoever. She's Her body's been left there now on this precipice. So I don't actually believe that Kralkatorik is going to take her for a minion. Um, and to what extent he actually wants to do that and likes to do that by tapping into his newly found Zaitan magic and all this mixed stuff, we don't really know. But I think because this episode ended with Aureen's body there, that's probably not the way that the devs are going. Of course, they might want to do that and also just thought that vision of Aureen on the precipice was so powerful they wanted to have their cake and eat it too. But yeah, I don't actually know if she'll end up becoming like evil or whatever. Uh, but that idea of the Altar of Gloss is fantastic to me. Uh, cleansing dragon corruption. We saw it happen to Glint. And like I said, there's been so much story about Glint. But one of the big factors of her life was what the Forgotten did to her and how they cleansed her. And having just come out of the Crystal Desert, you would have, th where the Forgotten were last really known to have a, a reasonable civilization, you would have thought we'd have more Forgotten lore. But there really has been so little. There was very little Forgotten influence in this patch, though we did get a cool hint at maybe an upcoming Necromancer Elite specialization I'll talk about later. Those of you guys who follow me on Twitter would have seen a bit about that. But uh, yeah, the Altar of Gloss, the idea that we might be able to take Aureen there to help heal her or something. Listen, if she comes back to life, which steadily I'm becoming more and more convinced by, there has to be a change in her personality for this to have meant anything uh, in her demeanor or whatever. And if it's that she's just completely mindless and messed up, we may end up going to a place like the Aura Gloss to sort of cleanse her of whatever Kralkatorik influence has riddled her or maybe Joko stuff. The thing is, this patch has established that Awakening and Joko magic is very different 
to Elder Dragon Magic. The devs kind of broke this speculative link we'd always had that liches may be resulting from Elder, uh, Elder Dragon, and particularly Zaitan influence. Like Vizier Kilbron was another big lich we knew. He became a lich after reading from the Lost Scrolls, which were in the vaults below Ara, which was where they hid all Elder Dragon stuff, and... You know, there was kind of a theme in Guild Wars 1 that ancient magics people didn't know much about and started messing with tended to be to do with Elder Dragons. Cauldron of Cataclysm seems to be another suggested one too. So anyway, there was kind of a speculative link between Elder Dragons and Liches. Last episode broke that though and said, no, there's no link and that's why we can have Awakened Silvari. So if Aureen's mechanism for coming back is because of the Joko side of things, I don't see how the Altar of Gloss will become relevant. But I do love the Altar of Gloss, and one of the things I think would be so badass for the game at this point, now that mounts are there and we have these enormous epic maps, is a re-implementation of Ara in its story mode version. So the explorable mode most of you are familiar with is actually a much smaller map than the one you visit when you're fighting Zaitan. The version of Ara you visit fighting Zaitan is a massive landscape, a huge area of ore. You just zoom across it because you're on airship all the time. Well, now that we're in Path of Fire Days with these enormous maps and massive living world releases, it'd be kind of cool to go back to Ara. Um, only in its story version, the full map, get it properly unlocked on the world map and represented there. And that would be an excuse to see the Altar of Gloss again. And it would be a kind of nice parallel to how last season had this epic finale in its penultimate release. And then the finale was in awe. And you could kind of do that again for Living World Season 4. You guys might think that that's boring, but I actually kind of would like that, that mirroring. So, of course, you know, the real finale of Season 3, let's be real, was Draconis Mon's Flashpoint, where we saw an Elder Dragon as well, right? It was obviously Primordis in the lava. Um, and, you know, the really big moments happened there. And then the last episode was kind of a bit of a, an excursion. And I know they didn't do too well, but the idea of returning to Or, I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, the Order of Gloss is a cool thought. Moving on, though, the next comment as well was about the original trial. And so, Ascension was mentioned by Glint in that. And, you know, they had their private conversation, whatever that may have been. Uh, but did you guys notice that we had to face a doppelganger during Ascension? Aureen kind of did that by fighting the branded Aureen. I hadn't thought about that at all, but that's true. In Guild Wars 1, when we attempt to ascend, one of the big parts of the trial is to fight a doppelganger. Even Guild Wars 2 players of the current expansion should be familiar with this now, because in the third map, the Ellen Riverlands, the trials of ascension kind of linger, and there's doppelgangers getting spawned by the meta event. Definitely go back and replay that, guys. Uh, so, yeah, we kind of had Aureen fight a doppelganger, didn't we? Another version of herself. I mean, explicitly branded one. But, yeah, so the idea that she's undergoing the rites of ascension. This is why I kind of want to look very closely back at the story. There were multiple trials we had to do in Guild Wars 1 to Ascend. Stuff to do with the Vision Crystal and whatnot. I wonder whether sneakily since maybe even the time she was an egg Aureen happens to have gone through these beats where she's ascended. What about all these moments where she's left our side? Has she been doing something important between the end of last episode where she disappeared and returning here? The devs have kept doing it and I kind of assumed it might just be because she's kind of a nuisance to have around all the time, as I mentioned in the video earlier this week. But what if they're actually going to express that as soon as she had that vision of her death over and over and over, it started dawning onto her that this had to happen and she had some guidance and even maybe did something really important in that gap that she left before she reappeared here. And the fighting the double ganger was the last part of her ascension. That'd be an interesting thing for the devs to do to justify her return to life later, you know, to show that they'd even breadcrumbed stuff even earlier on. Uh, and finally, another interesting insight. Kind of awesome that this episode is bookended by two crystal dragon corpses, both slain by Kravkatorik. There was Glint at the start and Aureen at the end. It really gives weight to what you said about the commander now finding himself in the same shoes as Destiny's Edge five years previously. Yeah, and that's a beautiful insight that I only wanted to include in my video here because the devs actually explicitly mentioned they tried to do that on their live stream recently, and that was kind of cool. Next question is from Nocte, who... Uh, just basically says, everyone is there. Meanwhile, Kazmir and Marjorie are on a second honeymoon somewhere, probably. Yes, the lack of Marjorie and Kazmir is something I wanted to talk about. Uh, obviously, Zodge is the main one, really, that we should be uh, dealing with. Kazmir and Marjorie, I can understand being away. And in fact, they do have a slight influence on this patch, supposedly. If you stand near a heart vendor, I think it is. I think it's Gorik in the south. If you stand near him long enough, he does have ambient dialogue where he uses his communicator... I think it's Gorik, to speak to Marjorie and Kazmir. Maybe we've got to be near time, yeah, actually, that made more sense. And uh, they discuss what Kazmir and Marjorie are doing. They are a part of this effort. It's just we weren't in direct communication with getting them to do things. Supposedly, they're evacuating nearby villages and whatnot, which was also one of the reasons for why they were absent in another one of the releases recently. You know, they're kind of your everyday heroes at the moment, doing 
the dirty work, the groundwork, getting your civilians to safety. And I think that's an important thing Guild Wars is kind of losing focus on a bit at the moment. I'm wondering if a really important story beat right now is to see Kraukatoric mess up some strangers. And what I mean by that is we're supposed to have all these, this investment in killing him now and this anger and this upset with him because he took something precious to us away. It's like on a personal level now. But the thing is, I don't think we've seen much... Um, you know, outsider casualties and just like the point is we're trying to save the peoples of Tyria and how much have we seen them struggle? Certainly not last release. There was that whole village that got branded. Yes I just wonder if maybe that we need to see a little bit more of that Casimir are the one and Marjorie are the ones with that story and we don't get to interface with it much But yeah, that is what they're doing There is a justification for why they're not in the patch and I think even voice acting so you know That's a million times better than what's going on with Zodger at least Next we have Lil Louie who said, for the record, I don't think the symbols and the Balthazar icon was for protection. I'm pretty sure it was Kraukatoric channeling their extra power to try and kill us in a massive blast. And of course, this is correct. This was probably the big mistake I made on my video. Uh, and just my weird impression of how things were going. I'm not sure what it was, but my first time playing... Seeing all those th that magical power and the idea that Aureen was there and we were being protected, I thought that it was just all these various things kind of defending us. Uh, obviously, we'd very recently seen Zephira bring all the Zaishin to our cause. And so maybe a part of my mind was like stuck in this loop of thinking, oh, this is in a weird way Balthazar's redemption. And Balthazar does deserve some redemption in a sense. And I, I when I saw that Balthazar icon, I kind of thought, oh, you, you know, the devs are really hammering home this idea that... Balthazar was more of a neutral force on the world than an evil one and here we actually see he's to our benefit kind of thing and we can tap into that with uh, you know, the, the great sword around or whatever and Aureen's consumed his magic and can, can, can tap into it. Uh, people were talking on the day as well about how it was actually trying to replicate the images of the eternal alchemy we saw in Omed's machine. Uh, on review of the footage, I'm not sure that's really what was going on with that Mega Blast, but they're clearly borrowing assets and ideas like these kind of orbs representing dragons that they're in the sky. And yeah, I definitely do think it's Zaitan and Mordremoth, but the more correct interpretation probably is that it's not these magics being conjured to defend us. It's Kraukatoric who's been feasting on reality and has his own portions of those that is using them against us. My confusion on that I think is actually an interesting microcosm of a larger thing going on with Guild Wars in that so many things are justifiable from so many angles right now that I, a player quite into the story, can interpret something in the complete opposite way I'm meant to. And it still kind of works, you know? It's still, like, vaguely justifiable. I mean, how we have access to Morgamoth and Zaitan magic in abundance to defend ourselves and stuff, you might question a bit more, right? Like, how much opportunity is Aureen really to have, had to have that? Which is why I go with the accepted Kraukatoric attack interpretation. But there's kind of a thing I'm trying to express here that Guild Wars... Like with Aureen coming back to life. Maybe one of the problems with Aureen coming back to life in the storytelling right now is not necessarily about robbing the stakes and what we're fighting for because now death seems so pointless. But it's just that the game has got to a point where the uh, the storytelling is so lenient and adaptable and convoluted, complex, that they can kind of very easily conjure anything they want to do. And maybe that's the real problem. Uh, and yeah, I think that that whole uh, that energy beam thing and my, my mistaking it might have been somehow a representative of that But yeah, it's a cool moment. Obviously. I don't care who's using the attack The fact that the icons are on the screen and stuff is is amazing So yeah, really cool and a lot of you guys wanted to chime in on that I got spammed pretty hard with uh, that correction right now next We had King Taku who said when they turned on Aureen when she brands the brand storm It was really cheap and bad out of character for most of the cast. I agree I didn't criticize the patch for this on the video, but I really should have. Uh, so we're talking about the moment where Aureen reveals she can brand things. And Ritlock becomes very cynical about that fact. And he kind of goes off on one. And some other people, I think, even defend him a little bit there. It does seem a bit out of character. Uh, I think the reason why maybe I glossed over it in that original video is I really am a big believer that Ritlock will strike out on his own soon and that they're creating some, uh, some kind of other tension between us and another character and sort of allowing the characters to live their own lives instead of just following ev us everywhere is really important. One of the main problems with the quality of storytelling through season one and two in particular was how everyone was just following us and they didn't feel like they had lives. So 
moving them away is a good idea. Ritlock's been with us for a long time and he's a brilliant character, but I think there's a lot of justifiable reasons that the devs might want to have him move away a bit. So for all that, I kind of like that he doesn't like the branding, right? The Aureen branding. But realistically, would he really care? Clearly she's fighting for us. Clearly she's, she's on the level, at least for now. I mean, it's scary to see the dragon be a dragon and that story works well at other moments. Certainly last release, we saw a couple of moments where, you know, when she eats Joko, there's that beautiful moment where everyone's like, oh my God, she just ate Joko. I guess she's a dragon, right? You know, that works there. But now we're at this intense moment in the plot where we kind of got to take what we can get and to question Aurene there, I think it was pretty cheap. Not, not too terrible, but it was. Next, we got Pen... Uh, Bellacroix? Is that supposed to be like Delacroix? Or is that just your name, literally? <laughs> also, there's going to be a mount next episode before we probably go back to bonds and such. They can't do a bond next episode because it would spoil Aurene surviving. A mount doesn't do that. So, yeah, there was a lot of conversation about whether the devs snuck this by well enough, right? Obviously, what they want the community to do, yes, is discuss this ad infinitum, which is kind of what we're doing. But... They also, generally speaking, probably want us to be convinced Aureen is dead. They want a few, you know, clever individuals out there to maybe have their little theories about how she could come back or whatever. And they may have dropped a couple of things in like that Awakened Savari. But on the general, I think ArenaNet want everyone to be horrified and shocked and sad that this dragon is dead and to take it for real that this dragon is dead. And they might have won a lot of people with that, but there are a couple of things about the game that I think undermine their, their desire there. And this is one of them. The season's masteries will go through the whole season. And the theme of it the entire way has been bonding with Aureen. There's lots of weird examples like this. We'll get to another comment in a second. I know some of you are probably thinking about it right now. Uh, so yeah, I just think about that too. I think that, and that never made it into the video, but... Uh, next episode, we're probably going to get another mastery. The devs have been talking about getting another mount this season, haven't they? I think they have a lot. Uh, so, if Aure if the big cliffhanger, as I'm speculating, is Aureen coming back to life next episode, uh, maybe it's not even a cliffhanger. Maybe she comes back to life and she's the, the seventh mount. <laughs> she's the next mount straight away, right? And that's the final mount and then that caps out our bonding with her as a mastery or something. I suppose they could go in a completely different angle and we get something like the Roller Beetle again and that's why we don't get another bond. That's fair. But I do wonder. Some people have been speculating we'll probably get a Mount Elite skill as well for the capper of the season. But I don't know if there's space for all of that. Uh, but maybe. So yeah, something to think about. Next, we've got Eddie Quizada, who says, a, a beautiful thing. Uh, I loved reading the comments because some of you guys are so on the ball. Uh, let's remember this poem, guys. The hero sought to save the world. If I keep trying, I'll be able to win, the hero thought. But the harder the hero fought the further the world seemed to tumble away. Drowning in doubt, the hero could not even save themselves. Hero, if you still believe in a brighter future, hold in your heart a thorn that can pierce all doubt. So if you don't know what this is from, the last line should be a bit of a tip-off. Uh, it's from the epilogue to Heart of Thorns that was added many months after Heart of Thorns ended as a current event series of quests and achievements that give you various Khaled Bulg inspired weapons. And if you complete them all, you get like the main or the, the big ultra, ultra Khaled Bulg or whatever. Um, so this was where you were speaking to visions like of Traherne and stuff as you went through. It was a really, really, really cool release. I did a full video on it as well. If you guys want to pause me speaking right now to go find that, and you can queue that up for the next one you watch if you missed it. It was in one of those quieter times for Guild Wars, so I'm sure a lot of you probably did. But it's a cool poem, right? And uh, I remember when they put that in the game, I feeling like, wow, this kind of expresses a lot of the setbacks we've been having as the story goes along. And it just it feels really poignant now, doesn't it? I don't think the devs were directly looking at this story beat when they wrote that in. Uh, and especially that last line, oh, if you have Caldebog, everything will be okay, probably isn't going to turn into anything. But um, yeah, it's a nice poem and very well uh, recalled by this commenter. Uh, Christ says, Glint totally knew who was going to be taking the trials early on. She calls the Scion her daughter at one point during the instance, and Vlast was a male. So this is in reference to my observation that before Glint died and she set all this stuff up, she had multiple scions. She had Vlast. She had eggs, right? And she didn't know who would be doing it, theoretically. So this is another one of those weird things, like I was mentioning earlier today, about her, her plot starts to get a bit weird. It's like, what did Glint actually know here, right? Um, yes, and you're right in the comments here. 
Aureen is mentioned as female. So how did Glint know that she was female? Did she just record two different versions that would, you know, figure out what it was that was in there? She doesn't actually say the name Aureen. So the devs didn't go that far. But the fact that Glint knew the gender of the scion that was in there might represent that she knew for sure. I'm not convinced. I just think this is a weird writing kink that unfortunately the devs didn't consider as they were uh, putting that dialogue in on this episode. Not a major problem, but I do think it's a bit of an inconsistency. Another reason why we got to start getting away from this Glint stuff. I love Glint and I love Guild Wars prophecies and I think this has all been brilliant for so long. But it's only going to get worse as time goes forward. Either that or I'm missing something. Next, we got Thornwolf, who said, I think this was the put us in our place moment. The slap of the hero to stop the relentless advance, to keep us from just rushing. We can't anymore. We failed, and it's a sign of good writing. So, I, I want to talk a bit about this here. I've seen a lot of people express this sentiment, and I'm not on board. I, I, I get what you're saying, but I feel like there's been a lot of ups and downs throughout this story, particularly through Season 3. It's had its dark moments. Path of Fire and season four there have been multiple character deaths there's been a lot of like lost territory as well and places that have been severely attacked um i think that the devs have been juggling that idea of us relentlessly advancing quite well it disappoints me a bit that so many players feel like we're on a relentless advance and i think it's to do with the way a lot of stuff's been packaged let me uh le let me put it this way i don't know if we really need to put us in our place moment when you actually look at the story on paper uh, going back to the Path of Fire release, right, we have a big moment where we die. Not a, a secondary character like Aureen dying. We die. That is, that, when Balthazar just slaps us down on that, that uh, you know, that, that precipice or whatever it is, and we lose, okay, that's a moment where we lose. And that was pretty recent. And so the only difference is that that happened in the middle of an expansion, which meant that players did that. They had that intimidating... There was an intimidating looking black screen where we lose all our UI on that one as well, remember? You have that black screen. But because it was in the middle of an expansion, people just kept playing the game. And they just kept doing the content. And so what is actually a very big story beat and a moment of stopping our relentless advance, we just kind of play through because it's packaged in an expansion. We do our quest in the Domain of the Lost. We're back out and we move on. Uh, however, for Living World... It, we've been forced to stop playing the game because it's the end of the episode. And what is actually less of a... Well, I don't know whether it's less of a setback. What's worse? Losing a Scion or losing the Commander? You guys, that's a whole story of its own, I suppose. But we have another major setback. But now, when that black screen lands, we're forced to sit with it and go on the internet and talk about it. And we remember it more. So... You know, I think if we if we get rid of all of that extraneous stuff, that outside stuff, that real world stuff, that how Living World is packaging Living Worlds, uh, how Guild Wars 2 is packaging Living World seasons and all of that stuff, which really isn't the story in, in its entirety. I don't know how much we should value that. When you look at Guild Wars 2 on paper, I don't think it's fair to say we needed a relentless advance. I think that that's misattributed praise for this release. It's great to have these moments. I just don't think that the game was deficient in them. Uh, until this release. It's just because we've been forced at the end of the cliffhanger. Just some food for thought anyway. Uh, it's good writing and it's nice to see, but uh, yeah. Moving on, we got Yojimaru Silverfang, who said, I did a second, and this is one of the angry comments. There's, a, there's not many, but some people do seem to really have been thrown by a loop. Here's one I wanted to spotlight for you all. I did a second playthrough a few hours ago, and the ending made me even angrier than my first playthrough. We did everything right. We were kicking Krakatorik's crystal and ass, and how did we lose? He roared, not like he hadn't been screaming his head off throughout the entire fight, and rocks fell on everyone. This put the PC on their back, which forced Doreen to throw her life shielding, uh, throw her life away shielding them. It's pretty much a rocks fall, everyone dies ending. So, I think that this is perfectly valid, what you say and feel here. But there's, to some degree, I think a lot of the community is able now to separate the intent of the writers and what something looks like when it's written as a script on a page versus how it's then eventually implemented in the game. You may not, uh, what you're, what you'll make an argument for is the plausibility of how this got so bad so quick. And you're very much built and thinking about the actual in-game movement and visuals of the encounter. Uh, which, yeah, isn't perfect. It does seem like it comes out of nowhere. My suspension of disbelief here comes from the very basic fact that 
Krakatox and Elder Dragon, he just had loads of energy still within him that we had no idea about. And then he took us seriously, and the second he took us seriously, he was able to roar and do this. But you're equating his last roar's animation as being similar to the previous roar's animations and saying it's the same and that there's no evidence that he should have been stronger. And I don't know whether we should really look at the game in that way. But I will say that Guild Wars 2 has always struggled with this and will always struggle with this just because the Luda narrative is not a strong point of this game. Uh, the gameplay very rarely matches the intensity of the story because there's no good baseline for player skill or player builds or understanding from the devs as to what will be too complicated or difficult or impossible for one player and still a walk in the park for another. And because we don't have that in Guild Wars due to poor tutorialization and all that other stuff that's fed right back in through core, they kind of... You kind of have to separate the gameplay from the story almost entirely, and it's a shame. If you look at single-player RPGs and single-player games that are essentially delivering a similar kind of thing to what Guild Wars 2 is doing here, they have much tighter control over that stuff, and they can match the two. Like, you know, even very old JRPGs, if they want you to lose in a big story beat, they might put you into a boss battle where the boss just does insane, obscene damage, and you lose... But it's, be, it's reflected in the gameplay properly. Guild Wars 2 can't really do that. It has to just have a cutscene where you do everything right. But then in the cutscene, suddenly the thing kills you. And it might feel cheap. But that's where we are as far as this is as an MMO trying to deliver a story, I'm afraid. And I don't think that they'll ever escape that. Not without radical redefines to player understanding and all kinds of things. Which I doubt that they've got the time or energy for. Next, uh, we had a very form funny comment. I'm just going to list this out. So is asking for Dragon Bash back. Now in poor taste. Oh, you devil, you. Absolutely not. I want Dragon Bash back. Keita's comment here goes back to what I was discussing earlier with the Mastery Bonds. The way they've set up Kate this release is exactly why I'm expecting Orin's death to not be final. I appreciate all of this, but it makes me feel like it's too easy to predict because of this thing. Uh, they needed to make this happen earlier in the season, not to make this a dead giveaway. And yeah, I agree. So you've got like the bonds, you've got the mechanical sides of the game. But to me, one of the biggest clinches also is, is the K thing. I think, in fact, if any one thing more than anything else... And there's lots of little components to this. Is starting to convince me that Orin probably will come back. It's this Kaith thing. You just don't spend so much time on a new model and all this stuff. Uh, to then not have it do anything. I mean, in theory, it can do something. On the stream you guys watched. In that final scene as I was staggering along the road. I made a... It's supposed to be all intense and horrific and, and sad and stuff. And you have that really good line. Uh, Where is she? And you realize that Orin's probably dead. Um, I said out loud, does this mean Case a vegetable now? And everyone I was playing the game with laughed and thought I was making a joke. I actually wasn't. That was completely unintended. I wasn't thinking about the Silvari thing. What I was literally thinking about is, okay, why do the Case thing to then just kill Orin off? That must be in the service of character development for Kaith then. They've transformed Kaith in body and mind. And now the thing she connected to is dead. Does that mean that, that Kaith is, is gone too? That because she's got this mental link and now her men half of her is, is dead, she's just going to be lost completely? That's what I was thinking. I was thinking that the devs were maybe trying to make this extra tragic by concluding Aureen's story and Kaith's together. And in that event... You might say it wasn't all pointless to do this merging and whatnot. But still, justifying the budget of making all the new art and stuff for Kaith just to appear for what genuinely is only a, a couple of minutes of gameplay. Well, not a couple of minutes. You know, one instance worth of gameplay. Would they do that? Probably not. So I think it's a giveaway, yeah. If not that Aureen is coming back, that something cool has to be happening with Kaith. I've heard some speculations Kaith is the one that will ascend or whatever. And uh, will just remain a conduit for Aureen while she's a dragon god fighting in the mists. I guess we'll see what they do. Uh, next, we have a question. This is going to seem really weird to you guys on this video. But I do think it's important to talk about just saying what achievement did you do at 1137? Uh, so, yeah, if you watch the footage of this, uh, this stuff, you'll see quite horrendously, I believe... When the big charge up beam attack is happening and we're in the final stages of that fight, you can look at my mouse. It's constantly mousing over the achievements and what I'm still eligible for. 
And I got to say, I hate that. This comment made me think about that. I really, really still stand by what I said way back in season two when all the complaints on the internet were happening. Achievements shouldn't be procking and triggering on our first time through these engagements. It just splits your focus between enjoying the story as much as you want to stay focused on the story and only care about the lore and whatnot. I cannot help my stupid monkey lizard brain thinking about the achievements at the same time and mousing over the achievements and, oh, am I going to get credit for this? It's so stupid. It should be incentive to play on a second time through. And to me, that was always obvious. I'm still frustrated at the community outlook on that back in season two. That they resent they're being asked to play the game a little bit more. And I do believe that the story suffers a bit. Just because, you know, they're, they're telegraphing stuff that probably they don't want the player base thinking about. But they're kind of forced to. So, yeah, pretty lame. Next, you got Verb Noun, who says, Would this mean anything for Vlast? I think in light of the end of this episode, Vlast has been a really cool thing to look back at. The more time that passes with Guild Wars, the more I love Vlast and what they did there. That idea of him instantly dying, and you get all of his story, but after the death. A lot of people really misinterpret what the writers were trying to do with Vlast in Path of Fire. And they think that just because he died early meant that they were gypped out of lore. But that's not true at all. There was a huge body of lore and voice acting and interaction with this character. Like he was platformed perfectly high quantities. Uh, more than many of the other characters in the Path of Fire expansion. They chose to have him die first. They kind of, they gave you both. Um, anyway, as the, the story goes along and now you see Aureen's dead and you see Glint's dead in this release And now you're thinking of Vlast as he suicided as well to to kill Balthazar. It's pretty crushing, right? I like to think of Vlast in those Trials of Ascension. I like to think of what he would have been thinking um, as all of this went through A dragon without a champion and just another uh, part of this trinity of tragedy Ben Smith says uh, not just a god but Cormir was a sun spear paragon. How did I not see this? The Zephyrite singing and chanting in the process of spear creation is cool, considering paragon shouts and chants from powering allies. I hadn't thought of that either. Yeah, but it's very paragony, isn't it? Anthems and echoes through these great dwarven halls. Might have been nice if the devs had uh, talked about that a little bit more directly. It's interesting to me that there was no Paragon Elite specialization with Path of Fire, but then they seem to have broken those boundaries in several places. Why was Renegade the Revenant Elite specialization for Path of Fire and Glint was Heart of Thorns? I know that Glint had some relevance for Heart of Thorns, but you really think about it, Glint would probably be better for the Path of Fire expansion and, I don't know, Carla may be better for later. Though, that's just another little reason why maybe the Blood Legion Homelands could be next. If they get a Living World episode in this season in the Blood Legion Homelands attached to the Path of Fire expansion, you can kind of say, there, yeah, that's why it was Carter and the Renegade. They always knew. Uh, coming to the end here, we've got Concrete Moths who says, Hey, do you remember how Bram was so into Jin's protection from the branded? He learned. Another awesome mind blow uh, for me reading the comments. This was just a minute ago before I started recording this video. And yeah, if you remember last release in the Sun's Refuge, Bran was kind of intrigued about, oh, how do you protect from the brand? Can you teach me stuff from the Jinn? Maybe he actually employed some of that in that defense here in this mission. Again, it would have been cool if the devs were more direct about the fact that that happened, but I'm sure that's what they're going for now. And that's another cool little tie from uh, the previous release. So really fantastic stuff and something I hadn't thought about at all. So well done there to Concrete Moth. So there you go guys a lot of further discussion about the patch and what we saw I'd love to hear any of your further thoughts and uh, again remember I'm gonna be bringing Q&A episodes back You can ask me about this release and I'm sure most of you will and law for this release But you can ask me about anything other games. I like uh, What it's like being a youtuber uh, Earlier Guild Wars lore, whatever uh, you can throw those down and I'll be bringing those for an, uh, an upcoming episode. Cheers everyone Thanks for watching more chat to come very soon. I'll see you next time